Hello everyone, my name is Joshua Huntingford and welcome to the master webinar series on bearing analysis. Um, today we will look at the bearing types used in master, how they are modelled and analysed, as well as the properties that can be modified to affect the analysis. Um, on your screen um, you should hopefully be able to see a question box. Um, you can use this to send questions to myself at any point during the webinar. I may try and answer these questions uh, during the demonstration, um, but more than likely uh, I'll try and answer them at the end. Uh, if I don't get around to anyone's question or if I cannot answer the question, uh, I will send in an email after the webinar is finished. Okay. So we'll just have a, a brief look at the agenda for the webinar. Um, the demonstration will be quite comprehensive look at bearings within master. Uh, so it may be, may be very basic in areas, um, but should get slightly more advanced as the webinar progresses. Um, so you can see, we'll start with a, a look at simple bearings, and we'll move on to rolling bearings, and I'll look at bearing settings you can use. Um, and at the end, if we get time, we'll go through a parametric study example. Okay, so we're on to, on to master. Um, okay, so I will start by looking at a simple master model. Um, this will allow us to, to really isolate um, the effect that the bearings are having on the, on the model. So I'm just going to open one of the example designs called Helical Gear Set. So you can see in 2D view, it's a very basic model. Helical Gear Set um, mounted on two shafts and each shaft has two bearings on. I'll just do a quick power flow to show you what's occurring. So you can see that the power is coming in through uh, pinion shaft and out, uh, rotating the wheel, and the power is going out. <coughs> um, so in master, master always represents bearings as these green components. Um, all bearings in master allow relative rotation between the inner and outer race, uh, but they also provide constraint or stiffness in any or all of the other degrees of freedom. Um, master bearings typically have two connections. Um, I say typically because they can, in some um, examples, have more, and we'll come on to those later. Um, so the two connections will be an inner and outer connection, or in the case of an axial bearing, there'll be a left and right connection. Um, bearings always connect to shafts in master. Um, they can also connect to housing FE. Um, if a connection is not present, uh, you get this hatched area that you'll see on one of the sides. And this just says that that uh, node is grounded, um, means there'll be no deflection of the component. So we'll talk about this bearing first. Uh, it's a very simple bearing, the default bearing called a concept bearing. It's just got a uh, simple linear stiffness, so you can see the basic stiffness option is engaged, and this just gives it uh, a fixed axial, radial, and tilt stiffness. If you'd like a more detailed stiffness, you can change the stiffness option to a matrix, and with that, that allows you to specify a full stiffness matrix for the object. Um, it's also possible to specify multiple stiffness matrices at a range of speeds uh, using the speed dependent stiffness option. Um, for now, just as a quick demonstration, we'll just stick with a basic, uh, basic stiffness and keep the default stiffness on. So when we now go to uh, our system deflection and perform an analysis, so we'll just run this first load case. We can see the axial loads in the system so the, the torque generated from the, um, the torque going through the mesh is generating an axial load and the reaction that's been reacted by the axial stiffness of the two bearings on this pinion shaft. Um, we can go on the 3D view as well and we can see how the model is deflecting due to, due to the radial and tilt stiffness as well as the axial stiffness. Um, you can also get some force arrows to see in more detail how, how it is loaded. We can go on the reports tab to get some detailed results on the component as we're connected, as we have the left bearing selected. 
Uh, these results all uh, revolve around the left bearing. So in the top, you can see that we get some relative displacements, relative misalignments, and some load information. Um, you can see that due to the, the radial stiffness being uh, one micron per kilonewton, uh, as you can see the load and radial displacement uh, matching. Um, and that's because, it, like I said, it is just linear stiffness. There's more detailed um, displacements and loads uh, further down as well. And at the bottom, you can get some stiffness and no deflection and load information as well. So this can be used as a good way to find your initial bearing, so you can find out what the radial and axial loads are, and you might be able to work out uh, a rough capacity uh, that you need for your bearing. Okay. So I'll go back onto design mode now, and we'll look at different type of bearing. Um, we'll look next at an axial clearance bearing. An axial clearance bearing just represents uh, a clearance in the axial direction. So in, in the real world, you wouldn't consider it a bearing. It would just be a, a gap. Uh, but the way that Master models it is it models it as a bearing. Uh, so I will mention it. Um, on this bearing, you can see that the right-hand side is grounded and the left-hand side is connected to the shaft. Uh, so that means, um, due to the clearance, that this shaft will be supported uh, in the right-hand direction. And when that clearance closes, you'll be able to control the contact stiffness and the contact diameter in the properties window. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just turn the axial stiffness on the right-hand bearing off. It's on zero. And this now means that this bearing, uh, this whole shaft assembly is only supported in one axial direction. So if we do a system deflection now, uh, because it's only supported in one direction, um, this analysis will fail. And we can go into 3D view, and once we reduce the displacement, we can see that the shaft had no support in one axial direction, which is why it is flying off. So if we just change the direction that this acts in, go in the connections and change, uh, swap the nodes around, we can see that this shaft is now supported in the left-hand direction. Let's just do a 2D view. So we can see from the axial loads in the system, this bearing uh, no longer has any axial stiffness. So all the axial loads from the gear are taken by the axial clearance bearing. However, the axial clearance bearing doesn't have any radial stiffness, so you will see a large radial displacement occurring at the bearing. If we go on the reports for the axial clearance bearing, you can see that it can't take any radial load. Um, and the current axial displacement is negative 23.8 microns. Um, and this should change if you apply uh, a mounting, uh, change the clearance in the mounting. Apart from that, the rest of the results are very similar to the concept bearing. You now just get a slightly more complex uh, stiffness matrix. So you're able to edit the clearance of the bearing by going into its mounting. If we just overwrite this value, we'll just apply a very large one millimeter clearance. If we now go on the results, we can see that the relative axial displacement is now 976 microns. And in 3D view, you'll now get it displacing far more in the axial direction as well as the radial direction. Okay. So we'll go on to the next basic, the final basic bearing is the radial clearance bearing. Again, like the axial clearance bearing, it's not really a bearing, it just represents uh, a clearance between the two components. Um, and when that clearance is closed, the reaction force is then applied. <clears throat> so just turn on the axial stiffness of this component so that the shaft is still supported axially. If we go back onto system deflection, 
we can see that the clearance bearing is able to take radial load, but unlike the previous bearing, it's not able to support it axially. And we can see that in the reports as well, so there'll be no axial load here. There's a few other options you can use um, when controlling um, a radial clearance bearing. So there's the option of providing a different contact angle. So for example, if I added a negative 10 degree contact angle, this would mean that um, if, uh, if a radial load, if the clearance was closed between the shaft and its mounting, um, any radial load produced would also induce uh, an axial load as well. It's also possible to have the radial clearance bearing acting over a different angle range. So the default is for it to act over the full circumference of the shaft. Uh, but this can be toggled by changing the angle range. So for example, if we said it only does 180 degrees, you can see that this bearing is supported in the positive y direction, but it's not supported in the negative y direction. Uh, and this can be used um, to many, many radial clearance bearings can be used in the same location if the radial clearance is different in different angles. Um, you can use this method. Okay, so that uh, essentially covers the, the basic bearings. Uh, we'll move on to some more interesting bearings now. So we'll go on to the rolling bearing. Um, <coughs> so when I select a rolling bearing, uh, master doesn't add a rolling bearing, it wouldn't know what type, it wouldn't know what size I need. Um, so you, it, you do just need uh, this designation window appears. And we select that and this now opens a new window letting us pick what designation bearing to add. <coughs> you can use this uh, search criteria uh, and type and catalog designation to help you narrow it down and find a bearing uh, that suits suits your needs. Um, the database is quite significant. Um, I think it's about 56,000 bearings. Um, and you can use compress to update to show all these bearings. Uh, but for now, we'll try and reduce the, the size that we're searching for. So we'll aim for a 4 of 20 millimeters. And we will look for a bearing type that is a radial ball bearing. And we can see there are still 756 radial ball bearings with a bore of 20 mil. Uh, so it gives us a lot of option to pick bearings. Um, all the information uh, here is sourced uh, from publicly available uh, content. Um, in the case of SKF, Schaeffler and Timken bearings, um, we are provided with, with the most up-to-date information uh, whenever that gets released. Uh, so they are always uh, as up-to-date as can be. When you select a bearing, um, you get a, a 2D view, a 3D view, and you get some bearing details on the right-hand side. Um, but it should be mentioned that not all parameters um, can be sourced. Um, sometimes um, PCD, groove diameters, uh, number of elements, etc. Um, sometimes these do need to be estimated. Um, so we do suggest for complete accuracy that you go to the manufacturer for further details. Um, <clears throat> so if, if you do find a bearing that you like, or if you find one that's close to what you're looking for, uh, you are able to select it and you can um, press OK if it's correct. You can also um, edit it uh, by going on copy bearing. Um, the reason it's copy bearing is because you're not overwriting the catalog you're creating a custom bearing. So if I go and copy, copy bearing now, I'm able to edit any of the parameters in here and I can select OK and when this gets added, it comes in as a custom catalog bearing. Um, so you can search for your custom bearings in the catalog uh, by going on custom. Um, custom bearings exist in the master model, so if anyone has, um, if anyone opens the master model, they get the custom bearing. They also exist on your on your computer, 
Um, so between, if you open another master model, you're able to search your database, your bearing database, to find um, a previously created custom bearing. Um, this is true for all uh, databases in master, so true for lubricants, material databases as well. Um, it's also possible to create a bearing from scratch as well, so you can go on this add bearing option. And this gives the same options that we got in the editor, um, but we're now also able to change the bearing type. Um, so we'll just go on to a ball bearing again and I'll talk about some of the parameters you can change. Um, so the basic on the basic properties tab, you're able to edit the envelope of the bearing control the limiting speeds um, and pick your bearing capacities. Uh, these can be uh, user specified or you can use um, one of the ISO standards uh, to calculate an approximate um, capacity. Um, the standards um, also have one for hybrid bearings as well. And this is true for static capacity too. On the, the race details, you're able to edit the raceway surface, um, the groove diameters, you can even turn the races off if that's uh, if that appeals and that's uh, more appropriate for your bearing. You can choose your race material. There's a list of default materials available, but you can also create your own material. And you can pick your, your rib height and rib chamfers. On the element details tab, uh, you're able to pick PCD, element offset, element diameter, number of elements, uh, and you can edit your element surface as well. If we now look at a slightly more complicated bearing, so let's look at a taper roller bearing, we see that you get slightly more, uh, slightly more options. Um, so the envelope is now far more detailed, um, requires more parameters to spe specify the exact shape. The race details are fairly similar though. Element details, slightly more complex again. And on the profile, uh, you now get microgeometry. Uh, you can edit for the bearing as it is a roller bearing. This is true for all roller bearings. <clears throat> so you can pick um, the profile that it uses. You can even specify your own profile on the user specified option. And you can do that for the roller, the inner race, and the outer race. So we are going to use, uh, let's use a slightly bigger bearing than this. You can use these uh, drop down boxes to sort the bearings by size. Find one. Let's find a single bearing. It's more appropriate. So I select this uh, Timken bearing as our ball bearing. See it fits there. And while we're here, we'll also change this to a rolling bearing to. I'll change this bearing to a cylindrical roller bearing. So on the, once a, a bearing has been added, uh, there's some much more significant properties in the window now. Um, so you're able to pick um, mounting clearances, preload, uh, the radial internal clearances, um, which are sourced from ISO 5753 if you pick a group, or you can overwrite this value to pick your own internal clearance. Uh, there's an option to control the a life modification factor, so you can pick an exact life modification factor or you can pick a maximum life modification factor, um, the default being 50. Uh, you're able to overwrite the design lubrication detail. Um, this will be the same lubrication detail uh, on the top level, uses the default lubricant in this context, in this case. Um, but if you'd like to overwrite that on a particular bearing, you can select this and then go into the lubricant editor. 
So in here, you're able to control which lubricant you use. Um, get those properties slightly wider. Um, you can control the contamination factor either using the ISO 4406 um, filtration, uh, uh, which will then use ISO 281 to calculate the contamination factor, or you can use your own contamination factor. Let's just create a new lubricant so I can actually control it. Or you can use your own contamination factor. Uh, there's options for the EP and AW additives. Uh, this controls uh, your viscosity ratio um, for modified lives. Um, there is pressure viscosity coefficient. Uh, this, this will modify your uh, film thickness if you're doing uh, that's that form of calculation. And your viscosity as well uh, will obviously modify uh, your efficiency and your modified life. There's also options for um, editing the race tolerance and support tolerance of the bearing. So for example, if we go into the race tolerance, um, the current option for race tolerance is to use values. So for the race tolerance inner, we're looking at the inner tolerance of the bore. You can control the upper and lower limit as well as the um, surface finish, or you can go on classes and master will use the ISO 492 um, tolerances to work out what the tolerances should be. Uh, and then these are used, uh, we use linear elastic theory uh, to work out what the interference is and work out how that affects the internal clearance of the bearing. In the case of the support tolerances, again, um, the support tolerance inner, so this is the outer diameter of the shaft. Uh, you can pick the tolerance and surface fitting reduction. You can use your own values. Or you can go on the classes and pick which class uh, the shaft um, tolerance is. Okay. So these, these bearings, roller bearings, are not, they do not have a linear stiffness. Uh, we're now talking nonlinear stiffness. Um, so the way that Master now calculates um, the displacements and loads for these bearings is it does uh, an initial force calculation um, and calculates the stiffness from an initial force. From that stiffness, it can calculate a displacement. It can then work out, it can then um, balances, it works out whether there's enough force uh, to balance the forces and moments um, in the system. And if it if they're not balanced enough, it will iterate further using a, a newton raphson solver to find the new stiffness. So let's go on and look at some results for the rolling bearings. So if we go on the axial loads, we can see that the non-locating cylindrical roller uh, does not take any axial load. Um, so all the axial load from the mesh is taken by the ball bearing. There's an option on the 2D view to show the Hertzian semi-major dimension for element closest to truncation. And what this does is uh, uses, because of the Hertz theory calculation and the contact angle, um, Master is able to work out uh, how far over the Hertzian ellipse is and it picks the one closest to truncation. In this case, uh, the element is truncated and you get a warning saying track truncation is occurring. Um, <clears throat> if you go into 3D view, quite busy now, you can isolate a bearing to see what's exactly what's going on. Control the, let's make that visible. You can see the loads on each of the elements. Here. We can see how the module is now deflecting and it's slightly more complex than what we were seeing with the concept bearing. So on the reports tab, uh, we now get some uh, significant results and this is where 
you'll be doing most of your bearing analysis, looking um, and working out whether your bearing choice is correct. Um, at the top, you get a, a, a table showing uh, a summary of all the main safety factors that are used, uh, that are calculated. If any of these safety factors are failing, they show up in red. In this case, they are all failing. Um, but just to show you that that's not always true, I'll just go on a slightly lower load. And we can see that if, if they're not failing, they show up in black. If they are failing, they show up in red. <clears throat> so the bearings are the, the ratings that it puts in this table are the ISO 281, ISO TS 16281, both, both basic and modified, it does an ISO 76 safety factor, and it does a maximum static contact stress safety factor on the inner and outer race. So there's significantly more tables now. So in addition to the displacements and loads we were seeing earlier, we now get some uh, basic details. We get all the parameters used for the ISO 76 calculation. The parameters used for the static contact stress rating, ISO 281 rating, ISO TS 16281 rating. At the bottom, you get information on the modified life calculation, including the A1 reliability factor. There's lubricant information, which was used in the calculation of the modified life. And there's mounting information. Um, so this comes on to the uh, fitting effects from the tolerances we were mentioning earlier. The fitting effects are currently off, um, so we see no change in radio internal clearance. Um, but if we turn these on, uh, you will see that the um, radio internal clearance adjusts um, based on the tolerance that was um, specified in design mode. There is also a DIN 732 speed rating. Um, and this, uh, you'll also get a warning if the DIN 732 uh, speed is exceeded. And the other parameters down here can all be seen in another window, so I'll come on to them. You get a detailed uh, bearing stiffness. And again, you get connection forces, node forces, and de deflections um, at the bottom, uh, which can be used for uh, an FE analysis or Whatever you want to use. You get very similar results for the cylindrical roller bearing as well, so I won't go through them. So, for more detailed analysis on the bearings, if you want to go look on a element by element basis, there's a bearing results tab you can use. If you go onto the bearing results, so here we can see. Uh, um, a bar graph showing uh, the parameters for each of the elements. So there are seven elements in this uh, design. And there's a drop down list showing um, all the calculated values uh, for each of the elements that you would want to, that you could show. Uh, for example, if you wanted to find the normal load on each of the elements, you can go on the normal load. You can find the axial load, uh, contact angle. Uh, maximum stress and over in this uh, bottom section you now get more detailed results on uh, similar results that you were getting in the reports um, such as the cage velocity element velocity these normal contact stresses just show uh, the Hertzian stress occurring um, as the element as following one element as it goes around the 360 degrees of the bearing on the inner and the outer. If we go on to a um, roller bearing, you get slightly different results. So you get the same window at the option at the top um, with mostly similar parameters. So you can view the normal stress, um, shear stress, normal loading. We see that only two elements are now loaded. There's now also um, able to display the loading across the width of each element. Um, so for example, we could pick the normal stress across the width of the element. 
and you can pick that for each of the elements, um, all of the elements, or the options to just show the, the worst value. Uh, it's, it's possible to export all of this data as well, so you can right-click and export it, and this allows you to copy the picture, if you click copy to clipboard, or alternatively, you can right-click and say copy data to clipboard, and this then stores it all as um, text, which you can paste into Excel, for example, if you'd like to post-process it. Um, We've currently been seeing results for a single load case, this 450 newton meter drive load case, but it's also possible to get results for a complete duty cycle. So I'm just going to run all the load cases. And when we do this, we now get uh, slightly different results up, up here. So we now get the fatigue life, which is accounting for uh, the damage done at every single one of the load cases. Um, the fatigue life is calculated using um, miner's rule, um, which sums the damage. Um, and the static safety is calculated from the minimum static safety over all of the loads. Okay. Um, so that's essentially covering uh, most of the detail on rolling bearings. Uh, I'll now go over some settings, um, so I'll go over some low case properties that directly relate to bearings. So if we go onto the low cases and duty cycles mode and click on one of the low cases, <clears throat> here on the um, bearing inputs tab you can see uh, a list of parameters that can be um, selected, uh, just toggled uh, for each low case. Uh, for example, you can turn on fitting effects. Uh, this is um, the parameter I mentioned earlier. It was off. It wasn't affecting the axial internal clearance. If it's on, um, master uses elastic theory to calculate uh, how the rate change in internal clearance um, should be adjusted due to the interference on the inner and or outer race. Uh, there's the option for thermal expansion effects. Um, so this would account for um, the thermal expansion, which could affect the radio internal clearance. It would also adjust the lubricant viscosity. Um, it could add actually axial induced loads into the system due to different expansion effects and distortion. Uh, it will affect efficiency and it will affect the oh, thermal expansion effects won't affect efficiency. Um, the default temperatures will. So if you have your thermal effects on, you want to make sure that your temperatures are correct. You can use the default temperatures or you can select your own temperatures. Changing the temperatures will affect uh, the efficiency as well as the DIN 732 rating. So back on the bearing inputs, uh, there's also the option of bearing centrifugal effects. Um, so this will account for the uh, loads, particularly at high speed, of the elements, um, it will move more of the load onto the outer race. Um, there is a ring ovality option. Um, so this accounts for um, slight, slight, um, a non-perfect circle as the race on either the inner or outer. Um, And there is, back on settings again, there's a, an efficiency option, so if we turn that on, there's two which are very bearing related, there's include bearing and seal loss. Um, bearing losses account for the load dependent torque and the frictional moment um, from ISO TS uh, 14179. Uh, the advanced needle roller bearing one is uh, an SMT inspired one which uh, uses advanced calculation of power loss in needle roller bearings, which takes into account the hysteresis, macro sliding, cage friction, and EHD rolling traction. There's an additional option for the gear blank elastic distortion to be active. Um, this will just include the effect of a flexible ring 
uh, on the bearing without having full FE. Uh, we will come on to full FE and I'll explain, hopefully explain this in more detail. There's also the option, uh, you can control all of the bearings in here, so you can control their um, internal clearances, their mountings, as well as controlling their mounting errors. Uh, so for example, if we overrode the inner support detail on one of the bearings, you're then able to provide a, an error either in the X, Y, or Z direction or in uh, apply a misalignment. Um, <clears throat> this can be done either in Cartesian or um, polar form. These options here also appear in the bearing properties in design mode. Okay. So I'll now talk um, briefly about um, about different types of bear uh, further bearings, additional bearings in master. So we can see there's still three more bearings that we can talk about. So there's the plain journal bearing. This is a this has a speed dependent stiffness in it. Um, there's a few options. So you can control the bearing type, whether it's plain oil fed or plain grease filled. If it is an oil fed bearing, you get the options of controlling um, the feed type. So the default is an axial groove bearing. There's also an axial hole or circumferential groove. Uh, if the bearing is an axial groove or axial hole, um, oil is pumped into the bearing through the groove or hole along the length of the bearing. Um, if it's a circumferential groove, let's just isolate the bearing. It's pumped all the way around the bearing. Um, this means it's got a reduced capacity from the other bearings, um, but it's useful if the direction of load isn't known or is in any direction. As for the axial groove, if the loading is in the same direction as the groove, um, you'll get a warning from master uh, as this could be um, cause for concern. There's also the option of a plain grease filled bearing. Um, this now has uh, important housing information and housing type information. These can be toggled uh, just to affect um, it affects the heat loss from the bearing, which subsequently affects the speed capacity and load carrying capacity of the bearing. So if we're on machinery encased, this is the housing detail. You get different details depending on what housing type you use. Now go on to one of the tilting pad bearings. So there's two tilting pad bearings, a thrust bearing and a journal bearing. Um, the tilting pad thrust bearing is rated using ISO 12130. Um, the axial bearing is rated, uh, sorry, the thrust bearing, yep, it's rated we're using ISO 12130. And the journal bearing, the radial one, is rated using DIN 31657. Um, they're both rated on a per pad basis. Um, in the case of the thrust bearing, uh, this allows for the consideration of the effect of misalignment and enables the moment on the bearing to be calculated. For the journal bearing, um, the per pad basis uh, differs from the approach in the standard, um, so it can give slightly more uh, accurate, accurate results. Okay. So I'll now talk about some um, bearing settings and top level bearing settings as well. So if we go on to the uh, top level of the design, there's a lot. Of, there's a few bearing options you can toggle in the properties. Um, these are mostly target safety factors. Uh, so for example, the top window bearing ISO 76 uh, static safety factor limit. Uh, picking one of the different options uh, changes the static safety factor limit from one to um, 1.5 or 3, depending on which one you pick, I believe. Um, or you can more easily just overwrite the values as well for the drawn cup needle roller bearings, um, fatigue life safety factors. And, and safety factors for contact stress. 
In the uh, settings of the of master, there's also some bearing options. So on the bearings tab, you can pick some default properties for the roller profile. Um, the failure uh, failure rate. So the default is 10 10% um, failure for a safety factor of one. Um, so this controls the A1 uh, reliability factor. You can pick any val any value here. Um, you can pick how the lubricant film temperature is calculated, uh, useful for the modified rating. So you can choose whether it's calculated from the element and ring temperatures or, with, or for the sump temperature, uh, depending on how the bearing is lubricated. Uh, the ex include exponent and reduction factor in ISO TS 16281. Um, this um, this accounts for the lambda and nu values in the calculation. <clears throat> uh, the tolerance factor is simply just means there's a warning if the bearings diameters differ by more than two percent in this case um, from the shaft in the design. Uh, you can change this value. And the ball reliability slope, roller reliability slope, and the C gamma value. Uh, these are from ISO 1281 and these modify the A1 factor for reliability. At the bottom there's this plane journal bearing misalignment factor. Um, this is a, an SMT property uh, addition to the approach outlined in DIN 31652. It's used to make the results of the anal analysis more representative of the film thickness variation across the bearing due to misalignment. Okay. Um, so now briefly talk about the integration of um, FE. So I've got this model already set up. Um, we can see that it incorporates many of the bearings um, that we've already mentioned. So over here you can see ball bearing, cylindrical roller bearing. You also get some additional of basic bearings. So there's a, a clearance bearing here and an axial bearing here. Here. You can see on the right, this bearing here currently doesn't have an outer race. Um, this is deliberate, um, seen as the outer race um, is essentially going to be part of the same um, the same component as the housing, because um, it's going to be press fit in there. Um, it made more sense to keep that as one uh, solid component to more accurate, accurately represent the stiffness and then that meant that it, it could be removed uh, from master um, and that allows a more detailed representation of the stiffness of the bearing. So we'll just add the FE housing. So I'm just going to quickly add a housing component. And I'll go on my import external FE mesh, just add my casing. So here we can see the mesh that's been added, uh, that was uh, created in ANSYS uh, external, externally to master, but it was saved out and brought into master. I just hide some of the some of what's going on. You should be able to see a little bit more detail. Um, here we go. So you can see that there was the bearing race is already part of the of the housing. Because it's a housing, master's found all components that it thinks uh, can or, or should be or should be um, connected to it. And when we create our nodes to connect these components uh, to the housing, uh, it will look in uh, the search region for them. So you can click on your each component. So for example, if we click on this component, you can see the search region in yellow that it's looking for and it's finding all surface nodes in this region. This can be toggled. Uh, you can change the search region to find to change which nodes uh, it tries to connect to. 
we can see that it's just creating a single axial node uh, for all of these um, all of these nodes. In most in most cases, that's not a problem, but it can mean that, for example, a large radial load applied in positive x direction, it should just compress the positive x direction, but the way that it's modelled, it would also provide a tension on the negative x, also dragging that in positive x. Um, so it doesn't necessarily represent the, the the correct forces, the correct load distribution uh, within this shape. Uh, so for that reason, that's why we suggest that you can remove the race and create a flexible node ring. So if I click on this on this component now, you can see that the current option is to create a single axial node. But if we go on to create a flexible node ring, master now creates a node for each of the elements. Um, this allows master um, to apply load just on the nodes that are loaded. So for example, that cylindrical roller that we saw earlier that only had two elements loaded, master would only apply force uh, on those two nodes. Um, and that would, that would affect the stiffness. Um, the downside to doing this is that it does um, increase the computational uh, and um, increases the computational effort and does mean, lead to a larger file size when you reduce the FE housing yourself, but it can be more accurate. Okay, how are we doing for time? Um, so I'll just do um, one example in a parametric study tool. Um, let's go on to the car axle design. So typically when you're trying to find the correct bearing, you may be flicking between um, system deflection mode uh, to work out whether where you need to improve, which safety factors you're low on. Um, <clears throat> but if you'd like to see uh, a parametric study tool, um, so you can use parametric study tool as a way of um, controlling parameters and seeing their graphical results and working out what the optimum value is, um, that can be used. So we'll just do that now. Um, uh, parametric study tool was, was the topic of the last webinar, so if anyone's not familiar with it, uh, there is more detail on the mode and you can view that on the SMT website. So the model I've loaded is um, just a simple um, hypoid gear set uh, as part of a differential. Um, both, both shafts are mounted with, um, the, the pinion is mounted with an O configuration taper roller and the wheel mounted with an X configuration. And on the, on the setup for the first low case, we're just going to look at how the effect of um, preload on one of the pinions bearings affects some of the safety factors. So this one's already set up. It's in the it's in the design mode or in the um, examples mode already set up. You can see that it's doing 11 steps in between negative 500 and positive 500 microns of preload. Okay, so it's run those 11 steps. And we'll now just add a linear sweep chart. So we'll look at one of the bearings on the uh, on the pinion side. And let's go and add the let's go and add a ISO TS sixteen two eight one basic safety factor. <clears throat> and we can see that the higher safety factor is likely to be within 50 and negative 50 microns, um, probably not that surprising that. But on the other bearing, uh, it's not quite as obvious. Um, there is a wide range of um, preloads that would work for this bearing. Um, if we look at a different parameter, so let's look at the maximum contact stress.
And here we can see why the um, 16281 safety was so poor at positive 500 preload, because the stress was so high for both bearings. But other parameters that may be of interest, you can't just look at the safety factors and work out whether it's safe, because safety factors don't account for uh, all parameters. We'll also look at the relative misalignment of the bearing. And we'll see that despite the fact that preload does reduce the life, it does reduce the misalignment. And you can use this as a good way of working out optimum preload. Um, alternatively, uh, there are options you can use to change the design of the of the um, of your model. So by selecting change design, this thing gives you much more freedom to come in here and completely change your model. So for example, we're now able to change um, parts of the bearing, such as changing the bore diameter, the cone angle, the element diameter. And you can use that as a good way to finding out what the perfect bearing should be. Um, that's my overview of bearing analysis in master. Um, I can see we do currently have uh, a couple of questions. Um, if you'd like, you can send in your questions now. I'll try and answer them. Uh, so the first question is, can you speak to your advanced bearing EHD results more? Um, we can have a greater look at um, bearing results. I think that's what this question means. Um, so we'll go back onto... Onto this one, and we'll just change this bearing back to a rolling bearing. So yeah, sorry, I uh, skimmed over uh, skimmed over the bearing results a little bit. Uh, so we, yes, we can look at them in more detail. So there's also the option if you've got uh, multiple rows or bearings, you can change this option to flip between the rows. Um, in the case of ball bearings, you also get the arc distance of uh, each of the bearings, how close they are to truncating. Uh, truncation is occurring on this bearing, so on four of the elements it is zero. Um, so the table uh, in the bottom half of the reports does it does give um, information on the film thickness, um, so you can work out with your surface roughness how safe that is. You get tables uh, regarding some of the the element details with the most basic of some of these drop downs already applied. One of the graphs shows the maximum normal stress and normal load uh, as the elements go around um, the circumference of the bearing. Um, I hope that I hope that answers um, your question. Is that the full question? Yeah. Okay. In comparison to ISO one four one seven nine palm grim based losses. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I will um, find that one out for you and email email that. Um, next question: uh, For giving user-defined race profile, what kind of measurement is required? Um, yes, uh, let's let's do that now. Um, so let's go on to a rolling bearing. And on the designation, we'll just create our own bearing so that we can change the race profile. So for example, if we go onto a user specified design, uh, master's default is to put, put 20 equally spaced positions, but you can have different um, axial, uh, axial positions if you find them. Let's just create, um, let's just create our own parameters um, so, for example, if you had measured your microgeometry, or if you knew uh, more detailed microgeometry, um, you could use that now. Um, 
So let's say, can't remember, can't recall what the x values were. But there were 20 of them, so it's not too important as long as we get 20. That's not two. So, for example, you can just come up with your own values. Um, that's going to be 21 parameters. That would be 20. So, you can paste them in here. <clears throat> okay. Um, as we are running out of time, um, any other questions I haven't answered, I will get back to you. Um, I will email the answers to you. Um, so that essentially uh, closes off um, closes off today's webinar. Uh, the webinar will be available online shortly. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, our next webinar will be hosted by Anthony Phoenix on Thursday, the 26th of July. And the topic will be working with imported FE components in master. Um, details to register will be available on the website shortly. Um, okay, um, thank you very much. Bye.